Welcome to the fourth lecture in Letters Bosman Methods. So we had, unfortunately, a break of two weeks due to my <coughs> um, infection with this strange virus that is going along. It was the first time for me in three years, but others, others had it three times already, so maybe I catch it uh, another time before Christmas, I don't know. We will see how to how to catch up with this. So thank you for um, for attending. And this time again. So today we continue a little bit from um, the last time when we derived the Navier-Stokes equation. So we look at the Navier-Stokes limit of the of the um, Boltzmann equation, and then from this we go to the one-dimensional lattice Bosman equation. So we'll start with the simplest case, even though this is not necessarily a very useful case, but just to get an understanding how everything works. Okay, so let's briefly recap the Navier-Stokes limit of the um, of the Boltzmann equation or the BGK equation, the Bucknagar cross krug approximation of the Boltzmann equation. So the Navier-Stokes equation, that is uh, right here, so I, I will explain what this means. So there's a rho, density rho, into the time derivative of uh, velocity plus this advection term, that is u dot nabla in u, and this will be equal to um, a pressure term that actually comes out as the speed of sound squared times rho with the star. So this actually accounts for the pressure plus tau times speed of sound squared, which actually accounts for the viscosity. Sorry. And this goes into Laplace, so second derivative of u. So this Cs square basically is the Boltzmann, um, Boltzmann constant times, times the uh, uh, temperature. And this rho with a star, this is now the mass density. So I have to admit that usually the mass density is written without this star. Yeah? Um, but unfortunately, last, the last two times I introduced the particle density with rho without anything to it. So uh, sometimes this is written with rho and dash as a particle number, and I've written it as rho. So in order to be consistent, now I have to um, rearrange the um, by the way, I guess this is missing here. I have to um, rearrange this a little bit. But don't, don't worry. I mean, there, there, there are different nomenclatures. Somebody calls this rho, and the other one rho, you can sometimes see velocity as u, sometimes as v, and so on. Yeah, Actually, um, something that you should learn when you come out here is that there's not always the same nomenclature and that you catch up what people are uh, talking about. Yeah? And even though if the nomenclature changes sometimes, you can catch up what it means. Yeah? It's not always the same letter means the same thing. Yeah? This, is, this is only in school. Not From here on, this will no longer be the case. Yeah? Everybody, everybody writes this a little bit differently. Okay. So what um, we have already uh, said, now unfortunately three weeks ago, is that this tau would be proportional to the Newton number and the Mach number, and this Cs square is proportional to the Mach number, uh, to the Mach number, of course, then one over the Mach number square. So that this tau cs square, which gives us um, 
the viscosity. So there are two definitions of, of viscosity. Yeah. So there's mu, the um, being the kinet uh, the kinematic. kinematic viscosity and this is equal to the uh, no so sorry I'm doing it the, the wrong way about this the dynamic viscosity sorry the dynamic viscosity is equal to the kin, kin, um, kinetic kinematic what is what is wrong with me I have long COVID kin Matic with causality, which we write with a uh, nu, um, usually looks very much like a we. Um, a mu is, and this this times the the density. Yeah. So this so this c this tau c s square is the the kinematic is the kinematic viscosity, and this kinematic viscosity is then obviously proportion to the Knudsen number divided by the Mach number, and this is something that we define as the Reynolds number. So Reynolds number. Any boy? Yeah. Is uh, the kinematic viscosity divided by the rho in some matrix? Dynamic viscosity equal to kinematic viscosity divided by rho. Um, uh, well, because it's Okay, you, you may be right because I'm I'm stupid now. Let me see. Um, how's this? The um, new uh, Hussein, help me. Um, because it's it's Pascal's. It is mass. You see, my brain, my brain doesn't 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 really work after um, this. <coughs> it is, it is um, because the, this 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 guy here has Pascal seconds, Pascal times seconds, and this here has a meter square um, per second. So. Yeah. Right, so I. Yeah, so because so this the dynamic viscosity has Pascal's times seconds, yeah, and the kinematic viscosity has meter square per second, which is the usual diffusion um, coefficient. So, but okay, coming back to the Reynolds number. Um, so, those of you have. Um, been in, in some lecture on um, so fluid dynamics, you would know this. The Reynolds number yeah, is is given as u times l. So this is let's let's write this as a capital U, yeah, which is a you know a velocity scale times a length scale, and this divided by the kinematic viscosity. Yeah, so you, you can also write this with the dynamic viscosity, then of course you have to multiply u times l with, with rho. Okay, so this is the definition of, um, the, of the Reynolds number, which is the important parameter for doing fluid dynamics. So u will be the velocity scale. <coughs> u is the velocity scale, l is the length scale. So these, these are some ominous things. So if you heard this the first time, you don't know what this is. So a scale, in principle, a scale is something that you define as a reference. Yeah? And this can be anything. So, for example, if you talk about the Reynolds number of a car, yeah, you could um, take the scale of the car being the length, or you could take it as the height, which will give you different Reynolds number. But 
if you define what is your length scale, or you could, you could take the mirror, the back mirror yeah, of the car as, as, as the length scale, or the, the, the wipers, or whatever, yeah, if, if you make sure you all talk about the same reference point, then this is well defined. Okay, so, but otherwise, um, otherwise it wouldn't be. So, okay, th these, are, these are the scales. And um, yeah, so one, one important thing is we got the Navier-Stokes equation. We have derived this. I've derived it standing alone here in this room in lecture three under the assumption that the Knudsen number is larger than zero, but the Knudsen number square is asymptotically zero, which you could say is a little bit of contradiction. And this is also the reason why, you know, the, the thing, everything to do with the Navier-Stokes equation is somewhat questionable, yeah? So the, mathematica, the mathematicians still don't know can we solve this thing or can't we solve this thing. From a physical point, you know, this is, here we have this, this, this wake um, thing here, assuming Newton number must be larger than zero, but the square of the Newton number must be zero, otherwise we don't get this, this equation out of, out of the Boltzmann um, context. So, okay, let's, um, because this is very important, so the Knudsen number number must be small, but it must not be zero. So again, I mean, what happens if the Knudsen number is zero? What equation do we get? No, not, not you, the others. What, what equation do we get if the Newton number is zero? We've derived this lecture three. You watched the lectures. <laughs> no, the, the, the this is this is what we get under the assumption that we that the Newton number is larger than zero and the Newton number square is is going to zero. If the Newton number itself goes to zero, then we get the Euler equation. Yeah? Yeah, when Reynolds number goes to infinity, we get the Navier-Stokes equation. Uh, the, the Euler equation, yes, sorry, sorry. <laughs> so, so what, um, what we have in a physical problem that we look at, independent of what, what scale we use. I mean, this is, this is kind of a, um, important, even though, even though it, it looks trivial, but this is a mistake that is often made in this context. Yeah? So if we, look, if we look at a specific problem, then this problem is character, the, the, the characteristic um, the um, factor of this problem that describes this problem is the Reynolds number. So the Reynolds number must be fixed. Yeah? Otherwise, we are not talking about the same thing. Yeah? So Reynolds number is always fixed. And the Reynolds number being, as we said, Mach number divided by Newton number, this must be constant for any particular problem that we are looking at. Yeah? Which means that the scale, so we don't, we don't necessarily know what Mach number is and what Newton number is, but we know that they scale in the same way. So this doesn't mean that they need to be anywhere near to each other. Yeah? Yeah, the Mach number can be a billion times larger than the Newton number. Often it is. Often it is. Yeah? And um, but you have the same problem only if the Mach number 
and the Knudsen number scales the same way. So you, you, get, you get the same physical behavior yeah, if you increase the Martin number and the Knudsen number together, or, or decrease it. So, um, only, of course, only as long as both of them are uh, sufficiently small, because otherwise you get, for example, in, um, you know, um, when, when you go across Mach number one, then of course you have a problem. <coughs> I mean, then the behavior will change. So, another very important thing is um, that is of course somebody, while we are here and doing things a little bit differently than other people, the Navier-Stokes equation is not the truth. This is another thing that Unfortunately, we have, we have to deal with this, be, this not being the truth. So mathematicians are looking for the, the question whether the Navier-Stokes equation has solutions or not, yeah? and you can uh, win a million dollars for this from a physical point of view. So this is, you have to know this is a mathematical problem. Yeah? Math the mathematicians they look at this equation and want to understand the behavior of this equation from a physical point of view. This is not the question. The, f the physicists are done with the Navier-Stokes equation. The Navier-Stokes equation is not true. Yeah? The Navier-Stokes equation is a very, very, very useful engineering tool, but it is not true. And um, this can actually be seen by some, some contradictions. So in physics, it is actually like this. You make one experiment. Um, if you have one experiment that you can repeat and is always coming out the same way, and it contradicts your theory, the, the, the theory is, is um, how to say, falsified, yeah? So, and it is pretty trivial it's pretty trivial to falsify the Navier-Stokes equation. Yeah? You can easily do things that are not possible within the Navier-Stokes equation. And um, I, th there are several of them. I'll just um, want to highlight one. So if you ever come into the problem of being asked, so you can give an um, example. So according to the Navier-Stokes equation, it is impossible for two bodies to touch. I mean, and this, this, this leads to a lot, to a lot of um, discussions yeah, between, between people who have different um, opinion of this, because it's not completely clear whether it's actually possible that some things touch. For example, in a, um, in a machine, we have parts turning, they usually don't touch. Yeah? They, they have lubricants in between them. Yeah? And so it would actually be a problem if they actually touched. Yeah? And th this is, this is a, an, an engineering problem not to make them touch. Yeah? But Apparently, they don't touch. So, can they touch? Is it possible that something touches something else, or is there always a little bit of fluid in between them? That, that's, that's the question. And the Navier-Stokes Navier equation would say that there's always a little bit of fluid in between. Let's, let's look at two bodies yeah, and say this, this body has a velocity of v1. It's moving this way. And there's another um, will, uh, body with a velocity v2. Now you, you already noticed that I've apparently now written this velocity not as u, but as v. But so what? Um, OK, so two bodies moving with different velocities. So according to the Navier-Stokes equation, the fluid that is attached to the surface of the body would move with the same velocity as the body itself. Yeah? So this is, this is called the, um, the no-slip condition. So velocity 
velocity close to the bodies, say surface, the body surface, is the velocity of the body. So it is called no slip. So the, the, velo the, the, the fluid on the surface does not slip. Yeah? This is why it's called no slip. And they have the same, the same velocity. So this means that bodies close to each other, because their surrounding has the same velocity as themselves, Bodies close to each other must have the same velocity when they come very close to each other. The same importance. Velocity. So, the problem is with being the same velocity If they have the same velocity, they are not coming any closer to each other. So, I mean, they, they can get closer, 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 but then their velocity approaches the, the same velocity and finally they have to stop and they cannot touch. But in, in this process, they come closer and closer to each other. Now, um, now you would usually come, I mean, when, when these things are discussed, in particular with people whose worldview is entirely on the Navier-Stokes equation, and there are many people, you know, fluid is Navier-Stokes equation, there is nothing else, yeah? Um, they, they will actually argue, well, this could be true. Yeah? This could be true that things get close to each other, but there's always some lubricant in between. Yeah? So am I standing on the floor, or can I, can I move? Actually, there's a, there's a good reason why this is, this is probably true, because what you observe in, um, in you go to outer space, yeah? and you put two metal things together, then they'll, they will weld, right? Yeah, because because they, they, they get in physical contact and and um, and and they will they, they will just form a, a, a crystal together. Yeah, which will not happen if you do this in air. But there is two reasons. There, there are potentially two reasons for this. Either there is a there is a small layer of air or water in between still, or the other reason why this, why this happens is because the surface is oxidated on both sides. So there is actually a covering of, um, of, of uh, oxy, oxy. What, what is your question? I mean, the equation, the earth, yeah, okay, we, we, come, we, come to the, we come to this uh, now. So, okay, so the question, <coughs> I, I write down my question, could this actually be true? So that things do never touch. Or are we sure that we observe bodies to touch? Now, how do we know that bodies could touch? There is... Um, okay, there, there are several examples. For example, one example that I'm not going to write down here, but um, which is also interesting, is the doing the opposite. Yeah? If bodies cannot touch, they can also not disjoin. Right? So in principle, if you take, when we were in a different room, I would take a piece of chalk and break it. I ask the question, so, you know, I did the inverse of touching. This was 
something that was touching and I could separate it. So should this be possible? The, the example that we are looking at is now the following. Say we have a, we have a raindrop. We have a raindrop and we have the ocean. Right? So it's a common observation that you have probably done yourself that if a raindrop fall, uh, drops into a lake or an ocean or a piece of or another body of water, they too merge. And this is only possible if these two things touch. Right? So what is wrong with the Navier-Stokes equation then? Why is this um, okay? Let's let's I'm keeping writing things up so that they will be in the notes. So the Navier-Stokes equation does not permit the merging of the drop and the ocean. And actually, you can observe. You can observe that when, when a drop hits a surface, that it sometimes stays on the surface for a pretty long time, right? You've observed this, yeah? So there's a droplet. And then after some time, it will merge. But it, it will eventually merge. Unless there, there's um, a lot of lubricant in between. There's also, you know, there, there's also these toys where you have oil in oil where they actually, the droplets don't merge, yeah? Um, <clears throat> so, okay. My, my point is, I mean, this is um, like, why can the bumblebee fly even though, according to the laws of physics, they can't because they don't care about the laws of physics that somebody writes down. Yeah? Fortunately, the, Navi the nature itself does not care about the Navier-Stokes equation. Yeah? That's important. So mathematicians care about the Navier-Stokes equation. The nature does not care about the Navier-Stokes equation. Okay? So, as we said, the Navier-Stokes equation is valid. So this is how we derived it. For Newton number being larger than 1 and Newton number square being 1. So this is mean this is this small, so this is what you have to know about um, the Newton number. It is small but not zero. Small but not zero. Okay, what does this mean? Say we have two droplets. Two droplets and say the one is going this way and the other one is going that way. So they come, they come closer. So the droplet, in between the droplets, there is a gap. And this gap has the length L, which say this is now our um, scale we are looking at, the gap between the droplets. Yeah? And then we have, of course, our mean free pass. The mean free pass is a function of the um, pressure usually, and we call this lambda. And the Newton number, the Newton number is defined as the mean free pass by the by this length. Okay, now the Navier-Stokes equation is valid if this number is much smaller than one. If this, I mean, if, it is, if this is close to, it is positive, yeah, it's larger than zero, but the square of it is zero, so it must be very close to zero in order for this to be true. Now, what, what happens if two things get closer and closer, yeah, um, then this finally is no longer true because in the gap, the Navier-Stokes equation is no longer valid unless, which of course is often the case, that L is much larger than lambda. So this is, this is the condition that the Navier-Stokes equation would, um, would work. So, and the, the problem here is 
if these bodies, or bodies in general, get closer and closer, then finally, lambda would get larger than L. And now, um, rule of thumb, lamb, uh, uh, rule of thumb, yeah, in the mean free pass, the mean free pass in air. By the way, anybody heard this? This is this is very um, um, interesting. Um, it's actually Albert Einstein calculated this in, in 1905 from from the viscosity. So he roughly got the right the right value for for the mean free pass in air, but just by observa just by observation. And this is actually the way he proved that the Navier-Stokes equation cannot cannot be true because it's uh, not, not scale invariant, yeah? So, what is, what is the mean free pass in air? Any ideas? Not you. Any, anybody else, any idea? What do you think? Give me a guess. Maybe in the scale of nanometers? Yeah, it's, a, it's in the scale of nanometers, but... Um, so how many nanometers? More like one nanometer, 10 nanometer, 100 nanometer? Probably 10 to the nanometer. No. Yeah. Then that would be micrometer. micrometer. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit between... Okay, it, it, is, it is usually... I think Einstein said it would be um, like 100 nanometers. So it's, it's, it's about 16 nanometers. Yeah? So this is... This is the scale at which the Navier-Stokes equation finally breaks down. If two things in air, in air, right? If two things in air get closer to, the, to each other than 16 nanometers, the Navier-Stokes equation is down. Yeah. Okay. Depends depends on the pressure. Yeah. Is is proportional to the pressure? The mean free uh, inversely proportional to the pressure is the mean free pass. Okay, so now I spent half an hour on this um, without coming to the actual um, lattice Bosman um, part, but I think this is very important. The Navier Stokes limit is still very useful. Yeah, don't, don't, don't now forget the, uh, don't tell people I, I said the Navier Stokes equation is, is nonsense. The Navier Stokes equation. Is a very good approximation for all fluid things in air that are larger than 60 nanometers. Yeah, this is, and this is a lot of problems are in this range, right? So, okay, um, the thing that that we now want to um, do is to use the Boltzmann equation on the limit on the Navier-Stokes equation. Yeah, so because we have um, last time we got the Navier-Stokes equation in terms of Boltzmann moments. So this was last time, lecture three. Um, so we got the time derivative of the moment M100. Okay, so this was in three dimension, of course. Mine is equal to the spatial derivative M200 equilibrium minus YM110 equilibrium minus the set M101 equilibrium. So this was one part of it. it continue with the next um, line, plus tau the x x m two zero uh, sorry three zero zero equilibrium plus the y y m one two zero equilibrium plus the z z m one zero two equilibrium. So okay, this this came this came out. Um, if we go to the Navier-Stokes 
limit, so the Navier-Stokes limit being Knudsen number larger than zero, Knudsen number square being zero. Okay, so this means we can um, solve the Navier-Stokes equation if we have an approximation of the Boltzmann equation that incorporates all these moments. So the moments that we have to incorporate, so we don't need to have the entire particle distribution function, we only have to have certain moments of it, that's an important thing, and the moments that are appearing here, so uh, because we can count up moments, yeah, uh, we, the highest moments that are appearing here are the ones that are related to this um, diffusion thing, and this is the moment M3 0 0 and M120 and so on, and they are third order third order moment. So meaning that if we solve the Boltzmann equation accurately till the third order moment, and we get the Navier-Stokes equation out. And this is, this is the idea behind the lattice Boltzmann equation. So finally we come to the lattice Boltzmann equation um, with the idea that, the up, that in approximation of the Boltzmann transport equation retaining up to third order moments should be sufficient to solve the Navier-Stokes equation. So important thing also to know, if we do it this way, we are not doing anything above the Navier-Stokes equation. Yeah? So this is very important also to know. Yeah? If we derive a moment, uh, model like this, we are not getting any better than the Navier-Stokes equation. We only get the Navier-Stokes equation. So there's no, no magic because we are coming from the Boltzmann transport equation. We should be better than the, than the Navier-Stokes equation. No, this would only be the case if we take more moments than these. Okay. So um, let's let's let us start with the simplest version that we can think about, and this is now a discrete velocity model in one dimension, in one D. So in one D has the advantage um, that it's um, that we can write down a very, a very nice characteristic characteristic diagram. So I warn you that this is something I'm pretty fond of. Um, so you should, you should take notice of, of this concept, how we can write down discrete velocity uh, models. Unfortunately, this is only easy uh, on, I mean, on paper if it is a one-dimensional problem, but we can also look at one dimension at a time. So namely what we do, I mean, I said one dimension, my paper is two-dimensional, so what do I mean with one dimension? One dimension, I mean one dimension in x, but our problem is always a problem also in time. So I write time my time axis goes down. So why is this? This comes a little bit from um, the way that such diagrams originate from um, the um, cellular automata, one-dimensional cellular automata. They are usually drawn like this. And lattice Boltzmann originally comes out of the realm of a cellular automata. So this is, this is why it inherits a little bit this direction of time. Time is drawn um, downwards. So what we have then here is points, which we call nodes, so-called lattice nodes. And they pro so this is um, 
they exist in space and in time. So we have here a lattice spacing that we call delta, delta x and we have a time step that we call delta t. So, and now we assume that there will be three different velocities, namely a particle stays where it is, so then in the, in the following time step it will simply be in the same position, or it can move to the left, so then it moves to the left neighbor, or it can move to the right neighbor, and um, this, this now is of course true for all these guys, yeah? So they can, now this can take some time to write all these errors, yeah, so they all behave in the same way. So there's one missing here. Uh, no, I've already drawn this, sorry. What did I want to do? I wanted to write it this way. Okay, so this is, this is how these guys are moving. And um, yeah, so they will, they will do two, two different things, namely they will be transported, which we call stream. Yeah, this is something that they do in between these nodes and in between the time steps, and then they will collide. And this collision is done on, on these nodes, and then they will stream again, and then they will collide again. Yeah. And then we have we introduce um, so this is this is delta x so this is space and this is um, this is time and then we introduce a velocity c the c is the, this is the lattice velocity is delta x divided by delta t yeah so one one crit spacing by one time step this is what we call the lattice velocity. So now I'm, I'm going to be a bad guy now, what I usually in, in my physics lectures I don't like my students to do, I'm now doing myself, so you know, this is, I'm a bad example here, but in, in the lattice Boltzmann method we're doing numerics, so we like to simplify things so that we don't have a lot of round of errors. Yeah? So our assumption is during our calculations yeah, we, are not, we are not dealing with space and with time. Yeah, we say that delta x is equal to delta t and this is equal to 1. So we are putting ourselves in the coordinate system, so to speak, where these two things are just 1. Right? Um, so this is, this is often then called the dimensionless, <coughs> dimensionless formalism. <coughs> Sorry. can be confusing sometimes. Okay, um, so what's, what we've introduced here is for each of these points, we had three velocities, yeah? Three velocities, we call our velocities usually xi, xi, because they are now discrete velocities, yeah? This is an integer i times c, and so this is, of course, I um, delta x divided by delta t, and I, in that case, would be an element of minus 1, 0, and 1, right? So this is, um, right, so this is, this is now our very um, simple discrete velocity model with three discrete velocities, and this has, as was indicated, two steps, namely the streaming step, where particles move with IC equal to I delta X divided by delta T, with I being an integer, 
So this is always important in lattice Boltzmann. Because it's an integer, it means that these particles or populations, okay, so they are not single particles. Yeah? This is a number of particles, or you could say populations, or the probability, because it's f, the probability that a particle would be there, right? So different, different points of view lead to the same conclusion. Yeah? Um, so these, okay, I, I write populations. I think this is the most um, correct, pop the, the least controversial, say, populations. Populations, hope. from node to node on a regular on a regular lattice doesn't need to be um, or grid say sorry grid doesn't need to be a Cartesian grid though there are other possibilities we're not going there too much into detail now um, the important thing is that the grid is regular so if you move by these integer steps, you will go from in one time step from one node to another node. Yeah? So there's no need to split anything up, it's just data moving around. Yeah? And then we have collision, this is something um, a little bit uh, more involved mathematically. Um, collision, this is, let's be abstract and say this is particles interact with each other in some way, for example, with the um, BGK collision operator that we've introduced. So, and this is happening on the nodes. And this leads to a rearrangement to rearrangement of the populations under conservation rules <coughs> so under conservation rules which of course means that conserved moments are conserved meaning they stay the same during the collision. So they are the same before the collision and after the collision, because they are, this means they are conserved. And the non-conserved moments, they change. They are the ones that are actually rearranged. So the bottom line of this is to define what is happening here, we have to look at the moments. Yeah? So then we have to we have to look have to look at the moments, which of course we have already introduced, but now we look at this discrete moments. Say now because we are um, we are in one dimension, we have only one index which I call, now call A. Now, I noticed this unfortunately looks a little bit like the Mach number. This is not MA. This is M index A. Okay? Just take a little bit care. So, this is our moment in one dimension. And it's in principle um, defined as the integral from infinity, from minus infinity to infinity. Our discrete um, distribution function, Fi, multiplied with a delta, Dirac delta function E. C, so this is its velocity, um, times the velocity C, which is now not a vector because we are in one dimension. And C, I'm not writing beautifully, C by the power of A, and this integrated over the velocity space C. So delta is the direct delta. And I assume that you've already that you know what the direct delta function is. So in, in case you don't, I just write down this is, if we integrate, so the definition of this is if we integrate it, 
um, with a function, say, this is um, G. We integrate this guy, so what what's drops out is the, fun the function at this position of the of where the direct delta function would be zero. Yeah, this is the definition of the direct delta. And uh, now because because we take this integral, we can now turn this into um, I mean it becomes discrete, and we get a sum over i f i i c a. Yeah, so this is now what, what the moments look like in lattice Boltzmann in general. Okay, let's, let's, um, we don't have that many distributions, so let's look at our moments. Let's look first at the moment zero. So the moment zero is, of course, the sum over fi, it's just the sum over fi, and this will be f1, f minus one plus f zero plus f one. So, okay. Um, um, okay, so I write this one with minus on top of this, which is just the definition of minus one. For negative lattice, lattice directions, so do you have an idea who is actually working a lot with lattices in, 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 um, say in, in research, in science? The, the guys who do, do crystallography, yeah? yeah so they, they have, they investigate how, you know, things arranged with each other. So they, they, defi they define how to write vectors in lattices. So there's a guy um, who was, uh, the, I think, an Irish um, guy with the name Miller, who introduced this this nomenclature, which is called now Min Miller indices. Yeah. So he he writes he writes a vector. Now it's very it's, we are in one dimension now, so we don't need this. But later when we are in three dimension, yeah, we have to distinguish between these. Um, these these um, these different directions with with a vector. Okay, I'm not going into much detail um, here because it's also pretty simple. So you don't need to think too hard about it. Yeah. Um, okay. First moment. First moment is turns out to be minus. So i is negative here, so a, a to the power a is one, yeah, so i would be negative, so it's minus, uh, minus f i, so um, i when it's zero, then it drops out, so we get simply um, f minus, f uh, minus one and f one, and this actually into z. And then the second moment, there we have um, i square, so it's, it will be um, plus and f1, and this goes into c square. And then we have m3 at the next one. So minus 1 by the power of 3 is, of course, again minus, minus 1. And this goes into 3 and um, C by the power of three, and then we go to the fourth, which is something that we actually do no longer need, but I write it down anyway. And this looks like this, okay? Now, again, I'm a bad guy because we said that the lattice speeds, delta x and delta t, they are set to one, so I now define this as one and don't care about the C anymore. Right? So even if I don't define it like this, you see, it, it would just be a constant. Now what you observe with this either being constant or being one is that you see there are some repetitions. Namely, the moment M3 is identical to the moment M1. So there's no further information in it. And the moment M4 is identical to the moment M2. Yeah, and um, the reason for this, of course, is there's only three discrete velocities, and 
by by the idea, say, you do a, a linear transformation between these distribu populations. So distribution is always this, the entire thing, and the parts of the distribution are the so-called populations, yeah? Because I probably didn't um, introduce this properly, yeah? So the F minus 1, F0, and F1, these are the populations, and all, to, they, all together they are the distribution. Okay, so we have these three different discrete velocities, so we have three different populations, and we do a linear transformation in moment space. So we have three pieces of information, and they stay three pieces of information, however we, you know, transform them. So this means we can only have ever three independent um, moments, and in this case they are not even they are not even de only dependent on each other, but they are actually identical to each other. Okay, so we have only three independent moments, but we have infinitely many moments, because we can, of course, evaluate our integral you know, to, to any order. And this means we have moments with the same name, and this is called aliasing. So you probably know, I don't know whether these things are still so popular as, as uh, they have been in, in my youth. Yeah? So when, uh, and if you had a bad um, you know, stereo thing, yeah? today everybody heard from their smartphone. Back then in the 70s, we had you know, big, big loudspeakers and everybody, so this is this made you cool back then. Um, so if, if these things were bad, then you will have aliasing or aliasing. So they, I, don't, I never know how to properly pronounce it. It's probably both of them in different parts of the world. So you have aliasing in your, in your sound or you have aliasing in a, in a picture if you have a bad, um, bad camera or bad, bad uh, transformation. So Actually, these two things are the same. Uh, uh, the, the mathematical reason is the same that we have here. That there are variables that reappear. Yeah? So there is one piece of information that reappears at a different point where you actually wanted to have a different piece of information. Yeah? This is called aliasing. So the mathematical background behind this is the same. Now, Okay, after introducing this, we see that we actually have a little bit of a problem which we later can solve, namely the Navier-Stokes equation requires up to third order moments. And we see they are not, they are not independent. Why? The, the problem is that we count moments from zero. We don't count them from one, we count them from zero. So we have M1, M, uh, so M0, M1, M2, and M3. So this is what we need, and they are four, right? They are four, but we have only um, three of them independent. Okay, let's say M0, this is the mass which is conserved, M1, which is the momentum, which is also conserved, okay, so we have not normalized it, so we can call it the mass, the, the, if, if the first is, if the zero is the mass, yeah, then the first is, is the momentum. Yeah? This. And then the third would be the energy, actually. And now the, the big question is the energy conserved. Who is for conservation of energy? Hand signs. 
who is not for conservation of energy, hand signs. Okay, very good. Why not? Because we look at the incompressible Navier-Stokes equation under the assumption of constant temperature. Right? So, under the assumption of constant temperature, energy is not conserved. Yeah? So, this is not... I mean, this is, of course, an, an error. So this, is, uh, this is not physically correct. But we look, we look at a specific limit. Yeah? So, not conserved according to the Navier-Stokes equation. Of course, you can write down the Navier-Stokes equation together with an energy equation, and then it would be um, conserved. But the, the thing that we had here was the assumption. And this assumption, we will later say, see why this assumption is, is uh, important. And that T is, um, uh, is constant. OK, we'll notice why this, is, why this is very important later today. OK, let's now go to our discrete BGK equation. Yeah? So the collision operator that we have introduced is not the only one that's possible, but um, that is probably the simplest one, is the Bagnaga cross krug equation. And now we have this in discrete form. Of course, the Bagnaga cross krug um, equation is something that is much older than the Navier's, uh, the, the sorry, the, the latter Bosman equation, and it also has a little bit of different meaning. It's coming from 1954, I believe, and um, and this has been adapted into the into the latter Bosman method as a collision ansatz. Yeah. So, okay. For the BGK equation, what we need is an equilibrium. And the equilibrium we know from the moment, so we can calculate the equilibrium moment because we know the ether theorem, yeah? so we, get, uh, we can compute them, and then we have to translate this equilibrium into the equilibrium for the populations. So let's start with the equilibrium moments. So fortunately, we have so many conserved moments that makes our life simple, because m0 equilibrium is conserved, so it is itself, right? It's itself. And we'll now call this rho. And forgive me that I don't write a star or anything else. Yeah? So this is now. This is now our discrete definition of, of density rho. Um, M1 equilibrium is equal to M1 because it's also conserved, and we write this as rho times u. Rho, u being now our discrete form of velocity. Okay? <coughs> and not, not the discrete velocity, but the, let, the, the velocity expressed in terms of lattice velocities. Um, so, and then this, the one guy who we decided is not conserved, for this guy, we know from the Boltzmann um, distribution that comes out of the, um, say, the, the ESA theorem, we know that this is rho times C S square plus U square that this would be its equilibrium. OK. Now, we have, unfortunately, we have the equilibrium for the third order moment is still required. Yeah? And this is something that um, we don't have independently, but we look at it anyway. So this would be 3 times u times rho into cs squared plus u squared. OK, so this is, this is something um, that we had to adjust. And you see, this, this is, of course, not, not possible because m3 is equal to m1. So they are not the same, right? Now we make, now we make an assumption that this here, what we, what we see is, I mean, the biggest problem is that here is u and here is u squared which together gives us u cubed. 
and we say that u cube is small and leave only this thing. So we suppose, do an assumption, that the velocity in general is small. We have to keep this in mind because it's only um, true if the velocity is actually small. So then if velocity is small, then u cube is going to zero, okay? Okay, so, and then we have this aliasing problem that m3 is equal to m1. Yeah, so this, this is our problem. This is our problem, and the way we are solving this is now doing the following. So, reminder that this CCS square, actually in, in thermodynamic um, is, is the Boltzmann constant times the, times the temperature. And this is, this is now where the point comes that we have to assume for this model that the temperature is a constant, otherwise it doesn't work, right? Because what we can do if the temperature is a constant, then we can choose the temperature as a specific constant so that Cs, Cs square um, cancels out with this three, yeah? So if we have C, because what we have to do is Cs square, if this is one third the lattice velocity, and now forgive me, we have decided that the lattice velocity is one, so yeah? Did you have a question? Yeah, so they get right. So we, we've decided that C that C is equal to one in order for the simplification. And so dimensionless, so this is why we have where we have the um, dimension then why we can me mess around. Okay, I'm I'm, I'm probably a bad professor today because I should probably not mess around and be very, very rigorous with, with all these units, but okay, let's, let's forgive me and we, we assume um, this, this kind of simplification. So this here is of course the speed of sound. So, and if this is equal to one, so CS is CS, I mean, Cs is the speed of sound, not Cs square. So this is one over square root three in C, yeah? Then, and then we have solved our problem, right? Because we have three times one third, and then, then the moment is, is how it's supposed to be, right? Uh, yes, maybe I, sh I should have done it like this. I should have solved it. Now I just wrote down the solution because I thought it is pretty obvious. Yeah, that if if there's a there's a three and if we put um, c s c s squared to three uh, to one over three, then they cancel out. Yeah, so this is why I didn't want to solve it here particu in, in particular. Okay, now. Since we've luckily solved this problem with the third order moment, we want to write our distribution, our, um, our populations. Our populations from the moments. And they will be, okay, now we have the moments. Yes, we have to start with the moments. So these are the equations for the moments. We have three, three of them. Uh, and M2 is 2F, F, sorry, minus one plus F1. Okay, so, and these are three equations which we can easily solve for F1 being m1 plus m2 divided by 2 f2, uh, sorry, not f2, f minus 1 is m2 minus 
m1 divided by 2 and f0 being m0 minus m2. So, and this now gives us, of course, the equilibrium. Or if we put, or no, let's say if we put the equilibrium of the moments, which is m0 equilibrium is rho, m1 equilibrium is rho u, and m2 equilibrium is rho. Now, because I eliminated all the um, units here, yeah, we just say this is 1 over 3 plus u square, which now, of course, is important that the velocity here is now given in lattice units. Otherwise, it doesn't work in delta x by delta t. Yeah, so this is, this is the condition, of course. So, and if we put this into the equations above, then we get F1 equilibrium as being rho half u plus one third plus u square. F minus one equilibrium is rho half minus u plus one third plus u square and F zero equilibrium is being rho two thirds minus u square. Okay, now I'm, let me see whether we get through the important stuff in the last 20 minutes now, because now we want to write down our letters lattice BGK equation. Lattice BGK equation, where we have, of course, our streaming, which simply looks like this. We have Fi is x plus i times c delta t plus, uh, and t plus delta t. So next neighbor and next time step is the outcoming population at the position x and the time t, and we call this the streaming equation. And then we have to collide collide so collide is the outcoming population f star x plus uh, x and t is the incoming population at this position plus omega f i equilibrium x t minus f i x t and this is what we call the collision equation. So important, important to notice here is that this distribution with the star is the post-collision distribution. Oh, sorry, the yeah, populations. And without star is pre-collision. And now we have, so this is, this is the BGK operator where we have not written tau, but we have the, written the inverse, which is omega is the collision frequency. So we, we, we prefer to multiply things instead of uh, dividing things. Okay, now we have a little bit an issue with this, um, with this guy here, um, when we look at our original diagram where we, where we said that the streaming happens in between the nodes and in between the time steps. Yeah? This is why we write this equation here in a little bit a different form, putting it in between time steps and in between um, grid spacing. So that will then now our streaming will be F I, so putting it in between means I'm moving everything. Um, so let me write this correctly. I see delta T, I move everything by one half step. 
Yeah? Everything by one half step, and I go only half a time step, going in between the time steps. And I also put, um, I also put this guy here, I also put this guy here on the other side of the equation, so I subtract it. If I, um, this is later more convenient if I do it this way. So since, since I moved everything here on this side, half time step back, I have to move the other side in the other direction, obviously, right? So I have now minus I C delta T half T minus delta T half. And because I put everything on one side, now this is being equal to zero. And <clears throat> the collision I rewrite a little bit just by putting um, just by putting this guy here to the other side. So I've just I've just taken this guy and put it to the other side. And this will then be equal to omega f i equilibrium x t minus f i x t. So now a little bit the problem um, that we are trying to solve in the last 15 minutes is that the, our Boltzmann equation, our original Boltzmann equation, never deals with this, with the populations before collision or after collision, they just deal with the populations. Now, in this lattice Boltzmann thing, unfortunately, we have two different things: the post-collision distribution and the pre-collision distribution. And we somehow have to make a decision which of them is the right distribution. And it turns out neither of them is the right distribution. Yeah. So we'll we'll now see. Um, we have to do a few calculations and then, then, then we see what is, what is actually being the, the right way of doing this. So now we have these equations. What, what we do, what we usually do in, in numerics anyway, is we assume that they are smooth functions and do a Taylor expansion. So we do a Taylor expansion of S in particular, so because they are not... Um, you know, this is, this is the thing that is moving around. You do a Taylor expansion of S at the position X and the time T. So we do a Taylor expansion in two dimensions, in the uh, spatial dimension and in, in the time dimension. So, and then we call this guy 4.1 because this is uh, lecture 4. And I put the zero on the left-hand side so that I'm done with it and cannot uh, forget it anymore. And then we Taylor expand around x and t, yeah? So, which means we, we start with getting the zero order term in a Taylor expansion. So, I, I, by the way, I'm assuming that Taylor expansion is something that is absolutely in your mind. I mean, like, th this, is, this is the basis on what everything stands, yeah? So, f um, i x t is equal to f i I mean, otherwise, otherwise I have to go back and, and give an introduction to this, but I assume that is not necessary. So this is, this is the zero part of the Taylor expansion. And immediately we notice that what we've written down here is something that we see in the collision operator, right? Yeah? OK, so then comes the first, the first part. So we, we now go in the different direction. So the first derivative in time. Yeah, gives us delta t, delta t half. So we go half time step, and we have the the um, the, the time derivative of now f i x and t, and now comes. So here is a minus. See here here is a minus. Okay. However, here is a minus two, right? So now we go. We go, um, for this guy, we go in positive direction. And for this guy, we go in negative direction. Yeah? And the same, the same step length, right? So this is why, together with this minus that we have here, we get a plus here. And here is our asterisk, right? So now, 
see, we get um, the difference. For, for this first part, we get the difference. And for the, or for the zero part, we get the difference. And for the first part, we get the sum of the two. OK, now this we also, we also do in space. Here we have the i delta t c divided by zero dx f i x and t. And we notice that the same thing is happening here yeah, because both, both x and t comes with, comes with minus on the other side. And now we come to the, um, to the second derivative plus, now this would be delta t squared now divided by 4. So one, one comes from the expansion and one, um, one from the one half that was in front. And this goes to dt, um, so the, t the second derivative in time. And we have f i x and t now plus or minus. Minus, right, we, because, because what is it? It is i squared, right? So this is, this is why we have minus again, f i m star x t. And so this, this will be the same. This will be the same um, for the spatial part, d x x f i f i x t. So here again, I have to close this bracket. Here again, we have a minus. And then we have a mixed term. So this mixed term is i delta t square um, c. And this divided now only by 2. And this is dx and t. And here again, we get the minus. OK, so this is the mixed guy. And now we assume that the rest is of order delta t cube, obviously. Yeah? So I'm going to need a few minutes more than. OK, now, now we have these, these guys here several times. And um, this, is, this is what later will come out as our variable. So I make a definition. I define that f i over bar is equal to f i plus f i star. And here again, what I've said in the beginning of the lecture, um, so this is, if you look at my papers, my publications, I'm always writing it this way. There are other people out there who write it the other way around, and they have a point because what later turns out to be the variable that is in the, Bo in the Boltzmann equation is, from my point of view, this f over bar. Yeah? Because I start from the algorithm and go to, uh, go to the equation. If you do it the other way around, you start from the equation, say there's this f without over bar, then you have to redefine your pre-collision state and call the pre-collision state f over bar. So unfortunately, you will find different, different nomenclature in, in in literature, this is this is what we are going to use here. So, um, f over bar is the average between the pre and the post collision state. Yeah. So if we have this, because we have to express our pre collision state, we can rewrite this as f as two f over bar minus f i um, star, which you can also write as f i one half plus f i bar minus f i star half. So why, why I'm writing it this way? I'm writing it this way because then in our collision equation, we can replace f i e q. So it was f i e q minus, minus f i, minus pre-collision state, but pre-collision state is nothing that exists in the Boltzmann equation. So we replace this by f i, f i, uh, by f i minus f i star divided by 2 minus f i bar. So this is simply, re this is simply introducing 
this here into the BGK operator. And having done this, we still, this guy here, that does not belong here, but we see we have the same thing on the left-hand side, so we can rewrite this as fi star minus fi, and this into 1 minus omega 1 half. Okay, so I've forgotten, obviously, the omega here, right? Yeah. So now we take this to the other side, and then we have on this side omega f i e q minus f i bar. So, and if this f i bar is the f is the f from the Boltzmann equation, then this is the proper way to write down um, the BGK equation, right? However, we have we have here a modification, and this modification is taken into the omega by writing f i. Um, asterisk minus fi is equal to 2 omega, so we divide by this 2 omega, omega minus 2. So I have, um, okay, I, I have multiplied this by, by 2, so to simplify it, F, fi eq minus fi bar. Okay, so this guy we'll going to call 4.2. And this 4.2 can now go into, into 4.1. So 4.1, so in 4.1 we have, so in 4.1 we have fi, a star minus f, fi, yeah? So this is, this is where we can plug in this equation too, and the other side of um, of this equation is now dt. So here we've replaced. So we had the sum of the two. So now we can replace this by our new definition fi bar. So we have the time derivative of fi bar in this case, plus. Um, plus delta t i, let me see, delta t i c dx f i bar and then then we still have the second terms delta t square half d t t f i minus f i star, which we notice is again the collision <coughs> operator. So this in brackets square, so we have the second spatial derivative, fi minus fi star, and we have the mixed term. dx and t, fi minus f I star. So, and then we have terms of order t square. Okay, uh, cube, sorry. So, now what's, what are we going to do with this, guys? One thing that we notice is that on the right hand side of this equation, we have delta t everywhere, right? which means that we can write that fi star minus fi is obviously of the order delta t, right? Do you see this? Okay. So if this is of the order of delta t, we see that it appears here and here and also again here and always together with delta t square which means that all of these guys here, say, I'm, I'm writing just one, for example, fi minus fi star, all of these guys are of order delta t cube. So we can put them, we can actually put them into the reminder, and this leads us to the equation, fi asterisk minus fi, which is equal to 2 omega divided by omega minus 2 fi 
EQ minus FI over bar is equal to delta T dT FI over bar plus delta T IC dx FI over bar plus things of order delta T cube. And now we have no more um, because because we replaced um, we replaced this this here by 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 the other guy here, we have no more pre or post collision in this equation. Yeah, we have completely eliminated this, and this leads us to the this form of the Boltzmann equation of the simplified discrete Boltzmann equation, F i now with one over delta t to be accurate which we assumed is zero is one, one over omega minus one half, so I've rewritten this, F i e q minus F i bar, remembering that F i bar is nothing that exists in our algorithm, yeah, it's just the, the equation that we are supposed to solve, so I've forgotten to write here O of the order three. Okay, so now this is our discrete BGK equation. So I'm one minute over time. I will um, pretty soon finish. I just uh, want to say that this tau, this tau is now redefined as one over omega minus one half delta T. So we have to have this modification this has been noticed very early on in the, uh, for the lattice Boltzmann method, and it has a name, it's called the Enon, so French um, so it's a French, um, yeah, French guy. Okay, I, I, draw, I draw a few, few more things now, because I want to end on the stencil that we are now using as a last introduction. So we are using three velocities, f1, minus one, f0, and f1, and we call this thing the D1, Q3 stencils, a stencil saying that D, 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 Q, Q, so this is a nomenclature that um, is usual so that d, the, the small d is the number of dimensions, so the number of dimensions here is 1, and q is the number of speeds, so the number of speeds is 3, so we end up um, with 3 speeds, and then there are, you can extend this to more dimensions by so-called tensor product lattices. So there are also other lattices, but tensor product lattices look like th this, that you get um, the Q of one dimension by the power of the dimension, which in, for example, two dimensions look like this. You have now nine, it's not very beautiful. You have now 2D is 3 by the power of 2 equal to 9. So you have D 2 Q 9 or in three dimensions. Now it's difficult for me to draw this. So you have this guy here and can extend this in in more dimensions. So this is um, 3 by the power of 3 is 27. So you get D 3 Q 27 letters. OK, four minutes over time. Very sorry, but to catch up a little bit. OK, um, I'm now stopping the, stopping the recording.